At 20 years of age I'm still looking for a dream A war's already waged For my destiny But you've already won the battle And you've got great plans for me Though I can't always see Cause I gotta go But if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me uh, to Numbers chapter 20, uh, and we're going to be starting in verse 1. If you have your chronological Bible, uh, you could turn to page 228. 228. Our, our sermon title uh, for this morning is Let God Be God. Let God Be God. Uh, some years ago, I was on a short road trip with a friend. I don't know. Do you ever get, have you ever been captured in a vehicle that you wanted out of? Do you know what I mean? I can't remember where we were going. I really think that it was probably to uh, Nashville, from Jackson to Nashville. And we got caught up in some traffic, and we had his toddler in the back seat. Um, and, and it was me and him and his toddler. So there was nobody there that knew how to take care of a child. Amen? And so, and we get caught in this traffic, like a construction traffic jam. I mean, stop, go. And the little guy in the back seat, he started saying, uh, how do you, he said, I want a geek. Like drink, no, he couldn't say drink. You know, he said, "I want a gink," and I was like, "Oh, that's cute." Amen. He wants a gink. Who wants a gink, right? And I was, I was thinking, and then about an hour later, I wanted a gink. Amen. Because we hadn't, we hadn't made it anywhere, right? And, and so, but this kid never quit. We didn't have anything to drink, and this kid's like, "I want a gink. I want a gink," and I was like, "I want to die." Amen. Let me out of this car. Mental note: never going anywhere with these people again. Right? It's just not working out. I want a gink. Well, this, this happened to Moses in this story. Moses probably had about 2 million people looking at him and saying, we want a gink. We want a gink. And he was about sick of it. Amen? Look with me in Numbers chapter 20, and we're going to start in verse 1. We're going to read uh, verses 1 through 13. It says this. It says, The entire Israelite community entered the wilderness of Zen in the first months, and they settled in Kadesh. Miriam died and was buried there. There was no water for the community, so they assembled against Moses and Aaron. The people quarreled with Moses and said, If only we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why have you brought the Lord's assembly into this wilderness for us and our livestock to die here? Why have you led us up from Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It's not a place of grain, figs, vines, and pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. We want a geek. Don't, that's not in your Bibles, amen. All right. Verse 6, Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the doorway of the tent of meeting. They fell down with their faces to the ground, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. The Lord spoke to Moses, Take the staff and assemble the community. You and your brothers Aaron are to speak to the rock while they watch and let it yield its water, and it will yield its water. You will bring water out for them from the rock and provide drink for the community and their livestock. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence, just as he had commanded him. Moses and Aaron summoned the assembly in front of the rock. And Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels, must we bring water out of this rock for you? Then Moses raised his hand and struck the rock twice with his staff, so that a great amount of water gushed out, and the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust me to show my holiness in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this assembly into the land I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord, and he showed his holiness to them. Let's pray. Father God, again, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this time together. Father, as, as we get into your word, God, bless your word. We love you. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray, and amen. So if you've got your bulletins this morning, go ahead and open those up and take those notes out. Uh, you'll see two sets in there. There's one for tonight and one for this morning. And uh, take those and, and just jot down a couple of notes this morning. But the first thing I want you to see is this. Number one, we need to let God be God in our needs. Write that down. We need to let God be God in our needs. I mean, what is this text trying to say? It's trying to, it's trying to talk about a God who can supply very, very basic needs, you know, like water. Like when you need a geek, 
Right? It can supply those needs. He's aware of our desperation. And these people had been there before. If you remember, if you've been in our chronological reading that we're doing, if you remember back in Exodus, they'd run out of water. The exact same thing had happened, and God had provided for them then. And they'd seen so many miracles. Think about it. When God had opened up the Red Sea and He had closed the Red Sea and, and He did all the, He had sent manna from heaven, what could God not do for these people? Evidently, they thought it was provide water. Evidently, they didn't think that God could provide water for His people. And there was that great need. And, and I, I can't help but think about this, how cyclical it is. What I mean is the story of our relationship with God and, and, the, and the story of God, it, it has a beginning and it has a, an awesome conclusion. And it's a river. It's a mighty river. And it just goes. And we're on that river. We're part of the story of God. But so many of us, I think we get caught in the, um, the eddies and the whirlpools. And we go round and around. And we have to learn the same lesson. Where if something happens and we're desperate. Oh, oh God, where are you? Oh, I'm going to have to do this on my own. And then God comes through for us. And then we're like, wow, God was there for me. And then we move on. And then the, and we get caught in another whirlpool. And we're like, oh, God, where are you? And we already forgot about how he's provided for us again and again and again. And that's what these people were doing. They had forgotten. Think about your life. How many times has God come through for you? I mean, seriously, I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe I need more God than you do. Amen? But when I, when I reflect on my life, God has come through for me time and time again. And honestly, I didn't always recognize it when it happened. It was later. When you, like, you know, when you didn't get the job that you wanted, I want this job, but you didn't get that job, but you ended up getting this job. And then you look back, well, if I would have went to that job, I would have got laid off in two months. See how God provided? You see what I'm saying? And we have to keep relearning these, uh, th these lessons. So let God be God in your needs. Look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. It says, my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Not you want, you need. But my God will supply all your needs according to his riches. In glory in Christ Jesus. Needs as basic as water. As basic as water. And God knew that they had this need. And, but I, I, when you read this, God was bringing them to a crucial moment in their lives that he might teach them something about himself. Now look at this. Number two. We'll move on. Number two. We need to let God be God in his own deeds. We need to let God be God in his own deeds. Now look again in verses 3 through 5. Numbers chapter 20, uh, starting in verse 3, says, The people quarreled with Moses and said, If only we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why have you brought the Lord's assembly into this wilderness for us and our livestock to die here? Why have you led us up from Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It's not a place of grain, figs, vines, and pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. When I read that, you've got to say that like in a pious tone. You know what I mean? You've got to put one hand on your hip. You know what I mean? Wag your finger. Some of you ladies know exactly what I'm talking about. All right? Not Alicia. My mother-in-law. I've seen that a couple times. Amen? I'm Marcus, you think you're marrying my daughter? Uh-uh. Okay, that's a lie. That never happened. All right. I know. It. And Diane's going to come back again, and she's going to hear about this, isn't she? All right. But here's the thing. And they're so pious, and they're like, oh, why have you brought us to this place? And, and that, nobody likes us. And we just, it's just awful, and then we should have died. And not only that, forget about the, the pomegranates, the, the figs, the vine. Now forget about all that stuff. There's not even water here. Moses, why did you do it? Forget about everything else. Why we don't even have water. And we tend to kind of sit back and think, I don't know about you. As we, I always think, don't they ever learn these rascals do they ever come to the place where they're like god's going to come through for us like he's done time and time again and think about moses i mean he's just not he doesn't uh, this mo he didn't want the job we've already talked about this but he didn't want the job and then he tried to resign at least three different times after he got it and then eventually he asked god to kill him and it, Moses, uh, he had spent 40 years in, at Pharaoh's college, and it's God had given, listen, okay, I want you to know something about Moses. Moses had this gift, this something that burned in his heart that God had given him. Moses hated injustice. He, he hated it. Uh, just, man, go back and read this whole account again, and you'll see it time and time again. They call Moses the great lawgiver because God had given the laws to Moses. But Moses, in his heart, he could not stand for people to be mistreated. And when he had reached 40 years old, what happened? He went out there and he saw this Egyptian guy beating up on a Hebrew guy. So da -da 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 -da, here comes Moses, right? He flies in, pounds that Egyptian guy, pounds him so good he's dead. 
right? And then buries them in the sand. And and some people, I, some I've heard, you know, in, in studying the life of Moses, I've seen some great theologians that said they think that Moses did this by the Spirit of God. I don't believe it. Well, think about the scene. He jumps in. He rescues this fellow Hebrew man. He pounds this Egyptian, kills him, buries him in the sand. And then he goes, looks this way, looks that way, buries him in the sand, covers him up. Now, that's not being led by the Spirit of God. That's a man who knows he just killed somebody. He's going to get in trouble. Amen. And so then the next day he goes out and there's these two Hebrews. They're arguing with each other. Da, 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 da. Here comes Moses again. He flips his cape over and he steps in. We're in the same family. We can't be fighting each other. And the guy says, why, are you going to kill me like you did that Egyptian? And Moses says, oh, did you see that? People have been talking? What's going on? So Moses is gone. He leaves, and it was a smart move. He should have left. Right? And so then he comes, he travels through Sinai, and, 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 and uh, he, tra- he comes to this place, to this well, and there's these he sees these women, uh, Zippor specifically, trying to water her flocks. And then these other shepherds are there, and they run their girls off. We're going to go for her. Get out of here. And then, and then here comes that bandy rooster Moses again. Right? Ba, 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 ba. And he just jumps in, cape to the side. Stop. These girls are going to water her. Right? And I, honestly, I think about Moses. He must have been a bad man. I mean, a bad man because these other shepherds, plural, they said, hey, <laughs> no problem, big guy, right? And they, they let my, the girls go ahead and water their flocks and all that. Moses had saved the day. Why? Moses could not stand injustice. It's just something, when he saw people being mistreated, he just couldn't stand it. And, and, and so uh, uh, Zipporah, actually, she goes home to her dad, and her dad's like, well, you're done early. And she's like, well, there's this Egyptian guy. He has saved us from the shepherds. And then the dad's like, well, go get him. I mean, don't you have any hospitality? Go get him and bring him to me. And, and he ends up going there, and he stays there for a while. He settles down uh, there, and he goes into what I, I call it the median agriculture school, right? He works for his father-in-law for another 40 years, marries the poor. They settle down, and God's training him. And so now he's 80 years old. And some of you are wondering when your kids are going to get it. <laughs> Some of you are like, when are my children, or when are my teenagers, when is my college student, when is my young adult, or w- when is my middle-aged child going to get on track with life? Right? Well, think about Moses. Moses was 80, and he hasn't even started doing what he was created for. He still hadn't taken hold. So he gets all this basic training. You know, he's watching those sheep. You know how dumb sheep are, right? And, and, so, and, and then after 80 years, and God finally calls him, and, and he's in this situation. He's 120 years old, and he's got all these people. I want a gink. I want a gink. You know, and Moses was thinking being a shepherd just wasn't that bad. Let me go back to doing what I was doing before. They're saying, why did you bring us out to die in the wilderness? Why did you do this? Now, these people surely should have known by now that it wasn't Moses that brought them out. It wasn't Moses that did it. He hadn't rescued them or drugged them out into the wilderness. It was God who had rescued them from the Egyptians. It wasn't Moses. It was God who had fed them manna from heaven. It wasn't Moses. It was God who had previously provided them with water, not Moses. We need to let God be God in his own deeds, whether we think they're right or not. Whether they line up with what we think should be happening or not. We need to let God be God in his own deeds, in his own work. And he needs to receive the glory. And in this particular instance here, if you look at verses 4 through 5, they say, why have you, why have you, why have you? And it wasn't Moses, it was God. We should never attribute anything to ourselves that that comes from God. All right, number three, let's move on. Number three, we need to let God be God in our crisis. Write that down. We need to let God be God in our crisis. I mean, this text brings us right to this. Not only letting God be God in our needs and letting God be God in his own deeds, uh, we need to let God be God in our crisis. Look at verse 6, Numbers chapter 20 and verse 6. It says, Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the doorway of the tent of meeting. They fell down with their faces to the ground, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Oh, they got it right, didn't they? All these people, almost two million people coming against them, and and, and why would you do this, and why would you do that, and we're all going to die, and we hate you, right? And what they do, they got on their face before God, right? And it says the glory of the Lord appeared to them there. They did so good. 
And so they're, they're in this great desperation, but then God's there and God answers them. And God had been present through them in a million different ways during, uh, during this journey. He was present through the cloud, the pillar of cloud by day and, the, uh, and, and by fire at night. And God, God was present in there. He showed their glory, his glory to them numerous times. Now look at what happened in verse 7. And the Lord spoke to Moses. Question, has God spoken to you Just briefly? Are you praying? You notice Moses was praying and the Lord spoke to him. If you don't feel like the God's speaking into your life and any, nothing's going on in your relationship with you and God, I promise you it's because you're not bringing it before him. The Lord spoke to Moses, take the staff and assemble the community. You and your brother Aaron are to speak to the rock while they watch, and it will yield its water. You will bring out water for them from the rock and provide drink for the community and their livestock. Now God says, take the staff. Take the staff. And there's other times in the Bible where he would take the staff and he would lift it up and the, the sea would part and he would take the staff and lift it up and the, the sea would close again. But this time he tells them to take it. He, he Take this symbol of authority. Take this symbol, if you will, of my power and, and assemble everybody together. You and your brother, get everybody together. And so what are we going to do? Two million people, okay, and, and, and probably a, a million sheep of goats saying, we want a gink. We want a gink. We want a gink. What are we going to do? We're going to get all those people together. We're going to gather them together, right? And what should we do? And God's told Moses to do what? Speak to the rock. <laughs> and you know Moses went like, Lord, what? You want me to do what? And God said, speak to the rock. And Moses like, Lord, you really think I'm going to walk up to a rock and be like, yoo I mean, seriously, Lord, have you seen the latest Gallup poll? Me and Aaron are only 1% approve of our leadership. We're, we're not going to win enough delegates, amen? It's just not happening, and now you want me to go talk to a rock in front of everybody. Now, Lord, should, couldn't we send out some teams probing for whales or, or something like that? God, no, I want you to speak to the rock while they watch, and it will yield it's water. So Moses, okay, so he took the staff from before the Lord as he was told. And Moses and Aaron, they gather all the people up. And there's the rock. And he said to the, and he said, no, nah, he said to the people. No, nah, he, he, he said to the people. He said to them. God didn't tell him to say anything to the people. God told him to speak to the rock. And he didn't do it. To the rock. I think he just had it. It's been 120 years, and he's like, you rebels. No, he calls them, you rebels, you make me sick. This job stinks. It's just not all it's cracked up to be. You're always complaining. You're always mad at me. You ask me questions that I don't have the answer to. You blame me for everything. I'm tired of it. And Numbers chapter 20, verse 10, that last part, he says, listen, you rebels. Must we bring, out, bring water out of this rock for you? And then he said, he, not only is he not talking to rock, he says, listen, you rebels, must we bring out water? Must we bring water from this rock? That little pronoun, right, teachers? We. We. Must we. What does a guy, what does a guy have to do around here? Do we have to bring water from a rock for you to believe us? He's so mad. He's so exasperated. It's, he, he's like, I didn't want this job to begin with. What do I have to do? And look what happened next, verse 11. Numbers 20, verse 11 says, Then Moses raised his hand and struck the rock twice with his staff. He hit it twice so that a great amount of water gushed out and the community and their livestock drank. Now, I know there's a the typical, uh, when you look at this, uh, uh, when people usually look at this, they say that Moses did wrong because he hit it twice. Right? He wasn't supposed to hit it twice. If you remember the story from the first exit, that he hit the rock twice. And uh, the text doesn't say that because God never told him to hit it at all. Go back and read it. He said, take the staff. He didn't say, use it. He never told him to even hit the rock at all. Look at, but listen, here's what the Bible says about it. Psalm 106, verse 32 and 33 says this. It says, they angered the Lord at the waters of Meribah. Man, that's where we're at. And Moses suffered because of them. For they embittered his spirit, and he spoke rashly with his lips. Moses got in trouble for what he said, not for what he did. They made him mad. They made his spirit bitter. He said something he shouldn't have said. He said something that God had not told him to say. And the Bible, the Bible clearly says it's what he said was the problem. It was his words. 
It's not that he hit the thing or what he hit the thing with. It was his words. He said, must we bring forth water from a rock? Is that what we have to do? And that was the problem. Look at Isaiah 42 and verse 8. Isaiah 42 and verse 8 says, I am Yahweh. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. That's what God says. In this case, God had brought these people to this situation in the wilderness because he wanted to teach them something. He wanted to show them something. He wanted to show them that he could rescue them just by speaking his word. He wanted Moses to speak the word. You remember Matthew 8 where that centurion had a sick servant and he came to Jesus and, and, and he told Jesus, if you'll just say the word, if you'll just speak the word, my servant will be healed. And you want Jesus to say, I haven't seen such faith in all of Israel. I haven't seen such faith in all of Israel. Then Jesus spoke the word and that servant was healed by the word of God. It's by the very word of God that the whole world was founded. Look at Psalm 33, verse 6 and verse 9. It says, the heavens were made by the word of the Lord, and all the stars by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke, and it came into being. He commanded, and it came into existence. He spoke the word. In Genesis 1, that ten-time uh, repeated phrase, uh, you know, uh, the Lord said, the God, then God said, then God said, let there be light. Then God said, then God says, by the word. And that's what God was wanting to show them right here, that he could provide for them through his word. Through his word. By his glory. He was going to show them his glory through his word. What the people were short of at that moment, they wanted a gink, gink, gink. They weren't short on water. They were short on faith. They were short on faith that God could provide for their needs, that God could come through to them uh, for them by his word. They liked faith in his word. So God was saying, Moses, say my word. And in front of your eyes, I want, in front of them, you just announce my words and watch my spirit move on their hearts when we do this. Let me ask you a question. Sunday school teachers uh, work with kids. Children, whatever you do, any of you, listen, do you have confidence in the word of God? When you sit down and you teach children or students or adults, do you have confidence that the Word of God can persuade men, or, men and women? I mean, not in a solid movement of the Word of God in the lives of people. Do you believe that the Word of God can change our generation, that the Word of God can change our culture, that the Word of God can change young people, that the Word of God can change old people, that the Word of God can change our church, that the Word of God can change our city, that the Word of God can change our nation, that the Word of God can change all nations. Do you have that kind of faith? And if we don't, we might find ourselves in, in the same situation these guys were in with a great need, and the only thing we can depend upon is the Word of God. We can trust His Word. Speak His Word. Only say the Word. And that's what God wanted Moses to do, to speak His Word. But instead, they, got, they began so well. They got in front of Moses and Aaron, got in front of God, and God, what are we going to do? And God answered their prayer, but then they turned around and so irreverently and in a rash moment with bitter spirits, and they're upset. Must we? They took credit for something that they never should have taken credit. They blasphemed. They exalted themselves. Instead of God, must we? And look at verse 12, the last part of verse 12, Numbers 20, verse 12. It says, because you did not trust me to show my holiness in the sight. This is one of the saddest verses in all the Bible, by the way. I'm sorry. All right, let's read. Uh, because you did not trust me to show my holiness in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this assembly into the land I have given them. Why? Because you did not trust me. You did not trust me. You did, not, you did not believe in me because you didn't set me apart. Moses, I wanted you to lift me up. But Moses, you lifted up yourself. Moses and Aaron, I wanted you to exalt me in front of all the people so that I could, I could take care of their needs by my word. But you exalted yourself instead. And now you're not going to go with the people into the promised land. Now, any time that God is doing a work through us and we point to ourselves, we're headed for trouble. Uh, Any time a, a church thinks that a program or something is the answer to the problems and not the Word of God, not, there's nothing wrong with programs per se, but we must be trusting in the Word of God rather than ourselves. And if we're not, we're heading for trouble. And when a crisis comes, when hard times come, and they will, if we're depending upon ourselves and we're not depending upon a God, we're heading for trouble. When we don't depend upon the, the presence of the wonderful Word of God in our lives, we're headed for trouble. Number four, write this down. 
We need to let God be God even when we fail. Even when we fail. So many of us think that God, that we have to do everything just right and be perfect. And it's really our effort with a little extra sugar on top from God. That, that we can do this on our own. If God will just help out a little bit instead of giving credit to God. And then we mess up and we somehow we think just because we failed that God can't move in that. But he can. What did Moses and Aaron do? They stand there and what must we do? And they hit that rock a couple of times. And what did God say? God said, hit harder. Keep hitting. Hit, I hope you hit all day because no water's coming out because you don't deserve it. No, that's no. That's not what it says, is it? That's not what the Bible says. That's not what he says at all. And now you might have thought that because it's the Old Testament and, and God judged his people and you might have thought the Lord said, listen, I'm, I'm not going to give you water because you don't deserve it. The merit of the people doesn't deserve it. The merit of the leadership doesn't deserve it. No water for you. Kind of like the, the soup Nazi on Seinfeld, right? No soup. No water. No water for you. But that's not what he did. He didn't do it. Look, look at verse 11. It says, Then Moses raised his hand and struck the rock twice with his staff so that a great amount of water gushed out. And the community and their livestock drank a great amount of water. Hey, do you remember the picture? I don't know about you. I can still remember the little pictures they used to put in our Sunday school literature and show Moses standing there with like a, a staff and there'd be this rock and there's like this little trickle. Like, I mean, you know, like, you, you know, you'd have to lay down in it for a week to get wet. Like, this is a little stream. It says that a great amount of water uh, came out. That's just not an accurate picture. So think about how many people and how many animals were there in the wilderness. Now, the Bible tells us really clearly that there were 600,000 men over the age of 20. And so if we gave all of them a wife and a kid, right, that, that would put them at 1.8 million, probably more than that. And if we gave every other person, every two people, a sheep or a goat, that's a million sheep and goats by itself. So two million people, over a million animals. And so if you, gave, if you gave all the people a half a gallon a day and you gave all the animals a gallon a day, the water would have to be coming out of that rock at something like 1,666 gallons per second. It's a lot more than a little trickle. It reminds me of this verse, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. It says, now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think. How God could do above and beyond all that we ask and think. And, and what this shows us is that God is a God of grace. Again, was it because the people deserved it? Everybody in here shake your head. No. D did Moses and Aaron deserve it? Shake your head. No, some of your heads don't work. Amen. We pray for healing right now, Lord. We, okay, can you just shake your head? No, do this. No, I can't shake my head. Good job. Uh, Y'all get an F. Amen. All right. Here's the thing. They didn't deserve it. Not at all. Do you deserve what God has done for you in your life? Not at all. Do we, do we deserve Jesus going to the cross and dying for our sins? Not at all. It was by grace, not based on our merit. We're saved by grace. It was God benefiting the men and women, the sons and daughters right here in our text who didn't deserve a thing. As a matter of fact, they deserve the opposite just like us, but he gives us grace. Now, number five, write this down. We need to let God be God when he says no. We need to let God be God when he says no. Many times God will say no. He says no in our lives. Think about that for a moment. Look at, look at verse 12 again, the last part of verse 12. It says, because you did not trust me to show my holiness in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this assembly into the land I have given them. God sanctions. God judges. Water came out of the rock abundantly. Water came out of the rock because of his, as a gift, because of his grace. But now he says to Moses and Aaron, you cannot go into the land. I know you've put up with these people. You've done all of this. You've served me faithfully all this time. But now... You cannot go into the land. Matter of fact, Moses asked three different times um, uh, if he could go into the land. Lord, yeah, hey, I know that you said, but maybe this time. And God said, no, I am enough. It's enough for you. I'm enough. You cannot go into the land. And it's this intercession. Moses, if you've been doing your, if you've read uh, the book of Exodus and Numbers, how many times was God like, I'm going to wipe these people out and start over. And then Moses got on his face before God and said, God, please don't do it. And then God listened. And now this time Moses has come before him saying, God, 
I want to go into the land. And God said, I am enough for you. He pays a dear price because of the very public nature of his blasphemy that he was engaged in. And it's no less than blasphemy. He blasphemed the very name of God. He blasphemed the very word of God. So it kind of ends on, on a sad note, almost, you know, uh, uh, that Moses cannot go into the promised land. Not that his salvation was lost. Not that, uh, not that say, he's not being remembered. We're talking about him this morning. There's probably thousands and thousands of churches all over the world who have mentioned Moses this morning. He's not been forgotten. But God said, I am enough for you. I am enough. I want to ask you a question this morning. Is God enough for you? Listen, is God enough for you? Is he? Only you can answer that. Are you having marriage problems, marriage difficulties, problems at work, you're having personal? Is God enough in whatever it is that you're going through? Whatever it is that you're worried about, is God enough? The question we all have to ask ourselves is this, is simply, am I trusting in God? Am I trusting in God's faithfulness? And while I keep having to relearn these lessons, I get caught in that whirlpool of doubt, insecurity, and I keep relearning, can I trust in God's faithfulness to get me where he wants me to be? Can I trust in that and stop trusting in myself and forgetting all the lessons he's taught me in my life? Whatever it is, as basic and mundane as water, Am I willing to bring it to the living God and let his word speak peace and speak authority and, and speak direction, speak hope, speak comfort, and speak love into my life? Am I trusting him with my heart or am I trusting myself? We're about to go into our time of invitation. Before we do, let me ask you a question. Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If you haven't, do it this morning. It's as simple as this. It's simple saying, God, I'm sorry. You know what, God, I've been saying, I want to gink, I want to gink, I want to gink. You're not getting this right, and you, I've complained against God. I've sinned. I've done things my own way. I'm going to take those things. I'm going to repent. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't, want, I don't want that anymore. I want you, and I'm going to trust you to save me. I'm going to trust you by faith. I want your grace. It's as simple as that. Ask God to save you. Maybe this morning you need to ask God to forgive you for all of those times when we haven't trusted in his word. Maybe God's called you to join this church, whatever decision you need to make. Let me encourage you. We're going to have our time of invitation. After our invitation, we're going to go into our Lord's Supper. Use this invitation to get your heart right with God. Uh, get your heart right. Don't let this opportunity go past. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you again uh, for this time this morning. Lord, we just pray that uh, this invitation will be beneficial to you, God. I just pray.